Hello, everyone. I hope everyone is having a great day. Um, I just wanted to introduce Dr. Sevier. Um, he is a cochlear implant audiologist and the clinical program manager at UChicago Medicine. Um, he graduated with his Doctor of Audiology degree from Pacific University and completed his clinical fellowship training at the University of Chicago Medicine. Um, so I will pass the baton over to him to start the presentation. How's everybody doing? I'm going to go over and talk with some hearing uh, about hearing loss, kind of the foundations of hearing loss with you, and then just kind of what options and treatment um, availability we have and different resources available in the city as well. Uh, I am a super informal person. Please just interrupt me at any point and ask questions if you have them. Uh, we'll kind of go through it as long as we need to or short as we need to. Uh, but I'll kind of hit on points and go through them as much detail as you need. But please let me know if there are any questions. I'm always happy to go back. I'm going to share my screen here. As soon as I figure out how to do so again. There we go. Everybody see that okay? All right. Just making you guys bigger on my screen. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks for having me, for one. Um, like Ashley said, I am Josh Sevier. I run the cochlear implant program here at the University of Chicago Medicine. Um, I have been doing mostly cochlear implants for the past 10 years. And I uh, do work with a lot of folks with hearing loss on that journey to get cochlear implants as well. But our team is extremely expansive and I will talk a little bit about that as we go for each step. We do everything from hearing tests to hearing aids, servicing hearing aids, um, alternative alternative communication devices, uh, and just kind of anything we possibly need for our patients. We have a huge multidisciplinary team and includes audiology, ENT surgeons, uh, we have speech therapists, and we also have social workers. So bringing that all together has been like a huge positive point, I feel like, when it comes to servicing our patients across the city. As we go through, uh, these are kind of the things that we're going to touch on today. I'll keep looking up. I apologize. I have tons of monitors in my office, and I have the presentation above me on a screen. So if you keep looking me look up, I'm just trying to see what slide I'm on. That's the only reason I'm doing it. Um, cause I like to see the people I'm looking at. So these are just kind of the talking points that I'm going to go over everything today. Uh, talk about what hearing loss actually is, uh, what causes it, the symptoms, the social impact. I feel like that is a part that doesn't get hit on as much as it should, uh, as well as the treatment options and resources we have available on our team to help anybody that possibly needs it. So, like I said, that's just kind of our bullet points for today's talk. But as I go through, if you miss anything, interrupt me, please. Uh, I don't want you, me to say something, you not catch it, and it fall to the wayside, and you forget what your question was later. So, please feel free to interrupt at any point. So, first off, just kind of starting off with what hearing loss actually is. I'm not going to go into super nitty de 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 detail on it, excuse me, um, but basically we have in our inner ear these little hair cells that pick up sound and they transmit them through our inner ear up to our brain for us to interpret. And over time, for multiple different reasons, sometimes those little hair cells is what those little tube things are there, they can get damaged. But what happens is, is when they get damaged, they don't grow back. And because of that, we experience hearing loss. And every single one of those little tube hearing cells codes in our brain for a different frequency, whether it be a low pitch sound, middle pitch or high pitch sounds. Once we start losing those little cells, it's kind of hard for us to put all the sound together in our mind of what we're actually hearing. So over time, if we lose those, which most people throughout their life lose some of them to some extent, some more than others, 
we have to find different ways to supplement our hearing when we don't have that support from those cells. So in addition to that, there can also be things that can prevent sound from getting to our ears. So having an ear infection, having fluid or congestion that blocks a lot off and can kind of dampen sound over time. But once that resolves, that's usually a temporary solution or a temporary issue that kind of resolves itself. But with this type of hearing loss with the hair cells, it is more of a permanent hearing loss. There are options to, like I said, help, but we'll go over them as we go through the presentation. Any questions about hearing loss just in general? Fantastic. So now, what are the different causes of hearing loss? There are tons, tons, and it affects people at all ages. Uh, we have even folks that are born profoundly deafened with like day one, and we have learned to find ways to treat those children as well. It can be something as genetics. One of your genes may predispose you to having a form of hearing loss, whether that be a certain type of virus or just a gene deletion. Your DNA has a lot to do with how you experience hearing loss over time. Uh, there are some causes that we can find out beforehand, so we know what we're getting ourselves into treatment-wise. Uh, but a lot of times, we will do genetic testing following the diagnosis of hearing loss just to see if it might impact some other members of our family as well. So it's kind of something that we're expecting going into it. A lot of times, just with age. As we get older, those hair cells are not as strong as they used to be and they will die off little by little. Usually in that case, when we lose our hearing, it's usually the high pitched sounds first. So things like telephone ringing or birds chirping, uh, utensils on a plate, usually those are the sounds that go first. So as that works in, hearing gets more and more difficult. The problem is a lot of the clarity we get when we hear people speak to us comes in those higher pitched sounds. So as that hearing loss progresses, we may hear them volume wise, but to actually put all that information together can be more and more difficult as we lose our hearing because it usually starts the high pitches and kind of works its way in. Uh, talked about viral infections. Here recently in the past few years, we're learning more and more COVID can have a huge impact on hearing loss. Uh, we just gave a presentation a couple of weeks ago, actually. We have a patient that had COVID six times in the course of two years, and it went from they had a hearing loss, they got a hearing aid, and then they had COVID again, and the hearing aid wouldn't work for them anymore. And then we gave them a cochlear implant, which helped, and then they got COVID again and again, and now we're running low on options. So we're learning a lot more and more about COVID. I think we'll figure out a way to get ahead of it here in the next few years. But certain viruses have a potential to completely wreck your hearing. And in addition to that, different types of bacteria uh, can affect our hearing as well. Heart disease, uh, anything that can kind of cut off oxygen flow in any way in your body, diabetes, a lot of these things factor into you getting hearing loss. So when we think about our hearing, we try to think about it as the whole person, what are we doing to treat cholesterol, high blood pressure, those sorts of things, because those all play a small factor in the hearing loss situation over time. Um, different medications. Uh, oddly enough, uh, things that we take to help us to make us feel better can also hurt our hearing. Uh, a lot of folks that get diagnosed with cancer and have chemotherapy there are certain chemotherapy drugs that are widely used that are very beneficial, but they're also toxic to our hearing. So we have to make sure that we stay ahead of that as well. Um, getting injured and hurt uh, in car wrecks, that sort of thing, you can lose your hearing that way. There's tons of different things we're still learning about, but there are so many factors. So a lot of times when patients will come in our office and they'll say, what do you think caused my hearing loss? That's a loaded question. There's, it could be one thing. It could be a combination of things. Um, I have a little bit of hearing loss myself. I was in the military for four years. Uh, I was a medic with the Marine Infantry. 
and exposure to loud noises over an extended period of time can also ruin your hearing. Mm, excuse me. So anything like factory work, farming equipment, gunfire, a lot of those things can also hurt our hearing over time. So it's never usually just one factor that causes hearing loss for us. It's usually a multitude of things coming together. Any questions on that at all? All right. I love talking about this stuff. All right. So symptoms of hearing loss. I always put this in there, particularly because some people may be experiencing this thing, uh, these type of things, and it's just one of those that hasn't really dawned on them just yet. But the most common thing that I hear is I've noticed that my family member has been turning up the TV a lot. <laughs> That's usually the first thing we always hear. If you're having a hard time turning up the tele or hearing the television, that's usually where it starts. And then if you find yourself repeating or getting people to repeat things to you. So I didn't quite get that. And it's because we're missing that clarity portion of the hearing that we were talking about earlier. So being able to bring all that together. If you're ever in a situation such as a restaurant or in a group support group and there's multiple people talking. If you have hearing loss, it makes it even harder to pick out what's being said to you over time. So one thing with hearing loss, even some people that have hearing aids will notice that when we're straining so hard to hear and actually physically exhaust you at the end of the day. So you want to go to bed even earlier. It makes you more tired. Call it listening fatigue. You're starting off and you're super focused. You're trying so hard to hear all the conversations. And by the end of the day, you're just flat out worn out. And that's completely fine, but there are ways that we can go about it. Sometimes when we start losing our hearing, also we'll notice a ringing or a buzzing sound in our ears. Um, referred to as tinnitus or tinnitus, however you want to pronounce it. That is a, we're still learning a lot about that as well. But what tinnitus is, in a nutshell, is when we start losing our hearing, our brain is trying to help us fill in the gaps what our brain doesn't realize is that that high-pitched sound that we normally get just happens to be one of the most annoying sounds on the planet, and we can't turn it off. So that is usually a symptom of high-pitched hearing loss coming in, too. And then if somebody is constantly saying, I feel like you're mumbling all the time. You're mumbling all the time. Could you speak a little louder? You're mumbling when you talk. There are some instances where it may seem like that for just hearing loss in general. What I always like to tell people is if you're having a difficult time having a conversation with people, make sure that you're looking at the person that you're having a conversation with. Even people with normal hearing do a little bit of lip reading. They just don't realize that they're doing it. So having a good communication strategy to actually participate in the conversation and looking at the person you're having a conversation with is extremely important. So those are just some kind of the, some of the symptoms of many of hearing loss. There is also instances where you can become dizzy. You become a fall risk. So sometimes when we start losing our hearing, it sways our balance. And the reason for that is there's multiple things that participate in our balance. One, just gravity, knowing where we are, being able to touch the floor. That touch sensation helps us with our balance as well. But then our eyesight kind of puts everything together. So if we're losing our hearing, our hearing and our balance are connected in the same organ. So when we start losing our hearing, it can affect our balance. And if we also have something that's causing us to have vision issues, that can get worse. So that may be something to look out for as well. This is something in particular I wanted to spend a little bit more time on is the social impact of hearing loss. One thing that I hear a lot is I can't hear anything, so I just stay at home by myself. People withdraw. What we're learning about hearing loss more and more is that can actually speed up dementia, memory loss issues, so we're trying to get ahead of hearing loss and the dementia spread by basically aiding the hearing that we have enough where you can communicate and stimulate your brain. 
So if you can't hear anything, it makes you want to withdraw because you can't communicate with friends or family members that you normally would. So I've had many, many patients that way. I've even had a patient with a cochlear implant who had had it for several years before I had met her. And she had said that she used to be the life of the party in her social group. And then once she was having difficulty with her hearing, even with her cochlear implant, she got to where she would just stay at home and not want to go outside because she felt embarrassed because she couldn't hear the conversations and was having people constantly repeat things. We got her cochlear implant completely fixed. It's working great now. And she has returned to being the life of the party. And uh, anytime that she comes in for her appointment, she always schedules them in the afternoon because she wants to make sure that she got breakfast with her girls and get her hair done before her appointments is what she always used to tell me. And I just thought that was the greatest thing ever. You can see the look on people's faces when they can connect with the people that they interact with on a regular basis. And it just makes me happy. When we have issues where we can't communicate, our relationships can struggle because we're not able to have those same meaningful conversations that we were talking about. Even though some people are spend so much time together, you can kind of read the body language of people in the room. If you can't have those same conversations, things get more and more difficult and it can cause some emotional issues as well. So we want to make sure that we stay ahead of that when it comes to hearing loss. Um, my wife in particular points out a certain situation to me that she tells that I can't hear anything anymore. And it's particularly when we go to a restaurant and there's a bunch of people talking around us, she will say that my eyes just glaze over and I start nodding. And that's when she knows that I have completely lost the conversation. But for me, it usually only happens in those situations. Um, I have definitely worked with hearing aids to try to make it better. So that has gotten better, but it's very important in those noisy situations. If you can find a way to treat it, it's great. It will never be perfect. I always make sure to tell everybody that you're still going to have some struggle with it. But what we have in technology modern day is able to help boost some of the speech up that we're directly talking to the people in front of us. It kind of helps drown out some of the background noise. It's not always perfect but it definitely helps. Any comments, questions, or anything on anything so far? I just want to hear from you guys too. If you're willing to share, that's completely fine. All right. Well, I, I do have a comment. Go for it. Um, fortunately, my hearing is fine, but my husband who's 95 has, well, he has hearing aids, but lost. But but trying to interact, he either accuses me of mumbling or of shouting at him, mm -hmm. you know. And I think sometimes that we don't think about what it requires to live with somebody who has hearing issues. You're because I right. find sometimes I don't talk to him because I don't know if he's going to hear me. And but it, yeah. It's just it, it is difficult and it takes more patience and it does. Um, and I don't always think about it, you know, so so it relates to the strained relationships, but it's not just from the person who's hard of hearing. It's also the person who lives with someone. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Uh, one thing in particular, I always try to tell my patients when they come in for hearing aid fittings is that communication is a two way road. So not only do you need to make sure that you're looking at that person and having the conversation, but also tell them that you need to advocate for yourself and make sure that the person yeah. you're communicating with does the same. So granted, when our family members get hearing aids, we think, awesome, they'll hear a lot better. But <laughs> hearing aids can only do so much. We do need to make sure mm -hmm. that we also try to build a habit of helping participate in that conversation the best way they can hear. And with hearing aids, as you may know, they sometimes they get wax in them and sometimes they sound a lot quieter. Mm -hmm. So then you feel like, oh, that person's mumbling at me. And then when everything gets mm -hmm. fixed, oh, man, they are so much louder now. So we definitely need to make sure that not only the person getting help with their hearing is uh, participating in the conversation the way they should, but we also need to make sure the family members that we're interacting with do as well. Mm -hmm. That's great. Doctor, my, Absolutely. Grand, 
with regard to mumbling, my grandfather always used to say, tell us to get our chins out of our chests. Yeah. <laughs> I've heard that as well. <laughs> this is Berkeley. I have another question too. Go for uh, it. I'm going to talk about solutions. I have the ringing in the ears. And is there, does the hearing aid help in helping the ringing of the ears? I know you can't really stop it. So I just wondered, what are the solutions? It does help some. I'm going to, when we get to the, the hearing treatment solutions, I'll talk a little bit more about that, especially since you brought that specific point up. Uh, there are options that can help with that. And I'll go over all that. Thank you for that. Okay. Absolutely. Um, yeah. One of the, the person that I think it was Jenny, if I'm not mistaken, said the whole chin to your chest thing that has gotten worse. And I feel like present day culture, because nowadays everybody has their cell phones and they're always looking down at their cell phones. That's right. That's right. Uh, so or they have masks on. That makes it even more tough. During the height of COVID, oh. working in this line of work was one of the most difficult situations that I've ever had. So I can only imagine what my patients were going through at the time. So absolutely. So if it's another one of those situations where a person with hearing loss needs to advocate for themselves. So if you see somebody with their face in their phone and not participating in the conversation, make sure to say, hey, I have some hearing issues. Could you look at me when we're having a conversation? And it at first, you may get a little embarrassed about it because you feel like you're being intrusive, but it's not really intrusive if you're trying to participate in your day-to-day -day life. So be there for yourself. Make sure to speak up for yourself. That way you can meaningful, uh, meaningfully participate with the people that you're having a conversation with. Couldn't agree more. Love it. Right. See, this has gotten fun. I love having these conversations. So this is where we'll talk about the treatment options here. And I'm going to talk about these as much as humanly possible. So if I leave anything out or you have any other questions as I go through, like I said, please interrupt at any time. Uh, the first one that everybody thinks of, hearing aids. Hearing aids is definitely our first stop. And we put hearing aids anywhere from... We had a one month year old with hearing aids as of yesterday. Uh, so early, early, early to 105. So anything in between. And so a lot of people nowadays were saying things like, I don't want these massive hearing aids and people to look at these massive hearing aids. I get it to an extent. You don't want to stand out and have people stare at you. But at the same time, you're trying to participate in the conversation. I will say on top of that, hearing aids technology has gotten so much better that hearing aids are getting smaller and smaller as well. We have some that are completely customized to the shape of your ear that can go completely in your ear canal. We have some that just have a tiny little wire that sits next to your ear and a tiny little part that sits on the back. And they've gotten so strong that we can do this with most types of hearing loss. But bear in mind the type of hearing loss that you have will also depend on what type of hearing aid would be best for you. So when you talk to your doctor about that, if you have a just a little bit of hearing loss, yours may be a lot smaller than somebody that has a very intense amount of hearing loss because it may need to be a little bit bigger to provide you enough power to hear properly. They come in all shapes and sizes and all different colors. And we can usually match them to your skin color or we can do crazy fun colors I had somebody get some hot pink ones a couple weeks ago. So the widespread range of that now has kind of gone overboard. Um, one thing that everybody asks, I want to make sure to share is what kind of a cost solution it comes with hearing aids as well. Unfortunately, and I do think this is crazy myself, and I hope it has changed here in the next few years, Medicare does not pay for hearing aids, which I think is one of the craziest things on the planet. It is something that affects so many millions of people across America and Medicare, the solution that we have to fix these issues will not cover hearing aids. I think we'll get there in the next five years. I know that's not the greatest of solutions. It doesn't help now, but Medicare won't cover them currently, but a lot of supplemental insurances will. The difference is, a lot of those insurance companies that do provide benefits won't advertise that they have hearing aid benefits. 
So what we always encourage people to do is make sure you call the insurance company or have somebody in your family call the insurance company to see if there is a benefit to that that could help you pay for some, if not all, of your hearing aids. It has gotten way better just in the past five years alone. I remember five years ago, usually no private insurances other than federal Blue Cross Blue Shield would cover anything for hearing aids. And now almost every company has some sort of hearing aid benefit depending on which plan that you have. So definitely call and check on that prior to. Outside of that, they usually range anywhere from about a thousand to two thousand dollars for a set of them to as far as up to about six thousand dollars for a set of hearing aids. Um, most people don't need the high end six thousand dollar hearing aids. To be perfectly honest with you, usually the but there's usually three tiers: a basic, middle, and a high end tier. Usually, the basic and middle will cover most things. Uh, so. If the premiums do get suggested, I'm not saying they're bad by any means, but you can always try something in the middle and then upgrade them if you need to within a time period. So all hearing aids have a, tri a tr trial time period to them, depending on which state that you live in. It's usually anywhere from 30 to 60 days. So if you pay for them and they don't work out, you can return them and get your money back. In saying that... Hearing aids are not something that when you put them on, everything is going to go back to hearing the way you did when you were 10, 15 years old by any means. A lot of times when you get hearing aids, they do sound kind of loud at first and you have to let your brain adjust to them over a period of time. And then you're able to hear a lot better with them. I have so many times where people will give it some hearing aids are kind of shock at first because you're basically having a lot flooded into your mind that you haven't been able to hear in a significant period of time, and it can be overwhelming at first. So one little anecdote story that I like to compare to that, if you allow me, is if you think about hearing loss, I want you to also think about your eyes. And when I say that, imagine falling asleep in a pitch black room. You've been asleep for two or three hours, the middle of the night, somebody walks in the room and flips the light switch on. The first thing you do is, ah, it hurts my eyes. So getting hearing aids is basically flipping the light switch on for your ears. It just takes a little bit more time for your ears to adjust to them in comparison to your eyes. You do have to give it time. So I will give that plug. A lot of people will get them and try to give up on them pretty quickly. Please stick with it. It will benefit you more than you will ever realize. Uh, any questions about that before I move on to the over-the-counter? Because I know I'm probably going to have a bunch of questions about the over-the-counter hearing aids, too. Are you getting something out of it? Yeah, I think so. Huh? Yes? Yeah. Oh, it's somebody. Oh, that's okay. Uh. Well, I have I have a question. Go for it. Now, my husband goes to the university. Yes, ma'am. But you all don't sell hearing aids. Is that right? We do sell got... hearing aids. Okay, so, so go ahead. Well, I was just because I think he buys them there, but I didn't know if if the doctors sell them. I mean, yeah, because often people need help sorting out all of the multiple options. And, and sure. different kinds. Mm -hmm. So the way it works with our university, um, we usually get people to come in and they'll have a hearing test first. And that's kind of our basis. And then we'll bring you and have what we call a hearing aid evaluation appointment. So we take your hearing and we sit down with you and go over all the different options of hearing aids yeah. that's best okay. for you. Okay. Yeah. So make sure that you have that hearing aid evaluation. So your doctor will go over prices of hearing aids, the type of hearing uh, hearing aid for your hearing loss in particular. And saying, when I say selling of hearing aids, we don't keep them in-house here. So when somebody wants hearing aids, we do have to order them and they're shipped to us. So we don't ever have them and you can get them the same day, but usually within the first week or two, we can have them here and we can do your hearing aid fitting. But we also follow up with people too several times to make sure that everything is right. If 
it's feeding back on you or you're having any issues with it, we can help reprogram and work with those to make sure that they're better for you. So the way I always like to tell people is we're along for the journey with people. And so we meet you when you first get diagnosed with hearing loss, and then we do everything that we can to go on that journey with you to make sure that we can get it to its best situation. So we do sell them here, uh, and they do have warranties on them anywhere from two to three years. So if something messes up on the hearing aids, we if we can't fix it here, a lot of things we can fix in-house. But if we can't fix it in-house, we can ship it out to the company, have it repaired or replaced, and have it brought back in. Does that answer your question? Awesome. We also have, uh, here in the past few years, we're seeing this huge over-the-counter hearing aid movement. And you may have heard about it. It is a great thing. Uh, there's some audiologists that will tell you they don't like over-the-counter hearing aids. Some of them will tell you they do. Uh, I am the camp that anything that can make my, my, my patients hear better, I'm a support for whether that means you get us through us or not, because at the university, we do not, none of the doctors get any kickbacks or anything. If you get hearing aids by any means whatsoever, honestly, I wouldn't work here if that was the case. I don't believe in people trying to sell people up hearing aids just to get money off of it. I want to help people hear. That's what's important to me. So nobody at the university gets paid or anything from getting people hearing aids by any means. I want y'all to know that too. Uh, the over the counter aids, we're getting ready to start carrying some of them at the university, but you can get them a ton of places all over now. I've had some people compare them to uh, reader glasses in comparison, mm -hmm. kind of like the ear equivalent of that. Um, I will tell you from what everything that I've learned about over-the-counter hearing aids, it depends on the type of hearing loss you have, how well you will do with them. So we have different classifications of hearing loss Anywhere from a mild hearing loss, moderate, severe, profound. Profound being the worst of hearing loss, mild being the lightest portion of hearing loss. Usually the over-the-counter hearing aids will only cover the mild and just a barely into that moderate region. So the top part, if you just have a little bit of hearing loss. If your hearing is any worse than that, over-the-counter is probably not going to be able to give you any benefit or support from those. Uh, they have them now to where you can kind of program them a little bit on your phone to help you. But the benefit with actually getting prescription hearing aids is we can actually program them to your specific hearing loss, not just turning everything up. So if you hear better in those low pitches and you can't hear as well in the high pitches, they won't turn up the low pitches to make them overwhelming. We program it custom to what you can actually hear. That is a benefit for that. The price difference in these things, over-the-counter hearing aids usually cost two to six hundred ish dollars. I've seen a few of them more than that. Uh, and if that is an option you would like to try, you're going to have nothing but support from me. Uh, I want you to try anything that you can to make yourself hear better and help your situation. But if you try that route and then you still find yourself struggling, please know that our team at the university is here to help you in any way that we can. Um, cochlear implants are also a option for hearing loss. That's what primarily what I do. Um, cochlear implants are an option for people that if hearing aids will not work for you at all. And I mean, we talked about the different tiers of hearing loss. Usually the people that are profound hearing loss, that the hearing aids are just not giving them enough support. Then we think about cochlear implants as an option. Cochlear implants do involve having a surgery. It is an outpatient procedure that usually lasts about an hour and a half to two hours. You go home, and then two weeks later, we turn on your cochlear implant. The outer portion does kind of look like a hearing aid that sits on your ear, but it also has a little magnet on it that sticks to the side of the person's head. So it takes up all the information, kind of like a hearing aid does, and it transmits it to the little device inside your head to help you hear. And it, just like hearing aids, they also take a little bit of time to adjust to. But most of our patients that have them do so well with them. Uh, I feel like they're an underused thing. And I get it. Trust me. I wouldn't want to have surgery either. I don't think anybody wakes up in the morning and thinks, man, I really want to have surgery today. But 
if we do come to that, just know that it's not an invasive procedure. It is an outpatient procedure, and we would not give them to anybody that wouldn't need them. So there is a qualification process that you have to go through in order to obtain a cochlear implant just to make sure that we only give them to the people that actually can use them and it will benefit them. Let's see. Just got a question here. Some Medicare Advantage plans do cover hearing aids and some supplemental plans do cover hearing aids. That's a great question. Um, it's another one of those things. Okay. Call and check your benefits when you do re-up your plans. Um, straight Medicare does not, like I said, but that's why a lot of people get the supplemental plans because they do offer some options. Also check with those supplemental plans because they sometimes will allow you to only go to certain places for hearing aids. So definitely look into that too. Mm -hmm. I would hate for anybody to be stuck with an unnecessary bill. I personally think healthcare costs way too much now and I would love to get it down. So please do check yourself, cover yourself to make sure that you're not stuck with an unnecessary bill. That is a great question. Thank you. Let's see. And then we also have some assistive devices. And when I say assistive devices, that could range anywhere from uh, in working in conjunction with a hearing aid to help amplify the TV so you can hear it a little bit better. There are certain things called pocket talkers, like a little box you can walk around. It's almost like wearing a little headset and it will amplify things for you a little bit better. Uh, for people that have hearing loss, there are also options with doorbells, alarm clocks, that will vibrate your pillow. They can uh, light up when somebody calls or rings a doorbell, that sort of thing. So there's a lot of options that we can work in conjunction with other hearing options in order to make sure that everybody has what they need. And Laura, I see you have a question. What's your question? No, I have a comment. Go um, for it. I have the AARP supplement. Mm -hmm and they have just instituted a, a hearing aid benefit. Um, I got my hearing aids from the, through them and they, they only gave me one choice. Gotcha. Um, but it was probably, and it was not cheap, but it was not as expensive as the numbers I'd been quoted at the university, so. Sure. Yeah, it's what I was saying, like they may direct you for certain places when you have supplemental plans and some places that you can get them only have contracts with like one in particular hearing aid manufacturer. And that may be what you ran into there. Um, I can't speak to them in particular. Uh, we have contracts with pretty much every major hearing aid manufacturer worldwide. So we do have multiple options for that. But yeah, that makes <laughs> sense with the supplemental plans. And honestly... I'm just happy that AARP has the supplemental plan added on. That's fantastic news to hear. Yeah, that's new. I mean, it came, I I just got my hearing aids about a year ago, and it, uh, it was new within a year of that. So That's great. Glad to hear it. That's awesome. One other option I just thought of, and I can't believe I just thought of it because it's it would affect me later on in life as well. If you are a veteran... If you have been in the U.S. military whatsoever, you are entitled to VA benefits for hearing aids. So anytime that I have a patient come into the university that is a veteran and they tell me they're a veteran because I like to get to know everybody. So I'm, I'm one of those guys that are very chatty and I'll get to know your whole life story by the time you leave. But if you are a veteran, you're entitled to hear, hearing aid benefits. You can go to the VA and get hearing aids for free. For free. So keep that in mind. Um, like I said, if I have a veteran come in and they qualify for hearing aids, I will let them know that immediately up front. You can go to the VA and get them for free. I will give you a copy of your hearing test so they can provide that information for you. Sometimes it may take a little time to get an appointment with the VA because they traditionally do get backed up. I know from experience there, but veteran status does give you free hearing aids. Go for it, Mary. Um, I have an assistive device that I see a number of people. I'm in a retirement community. A number of people have. They work different ways. I don't know whether you can see or this shows up for other people. 
it it's just a, li a little am amplifier that in my case connects via my phone um but it's especially good when you're sitting at a table with three or four people and knocks out some of the background noise and it brings you the voices of the people sitting around you. It's not really good for either a large table or any real big group of people, but it certainly helps with smaller socializing. Smaller for sure. Yeah. No, that's amazing. Yeah. There are some things like that. There are certain microphones and like little headsets that you can wear that will stream things in. Uh, you can also get those little microphones as accessories when you get hearing aids or cochlear implants as well, anything like that. Uh, we can actually Bluetooth pair them and you can have a person wear a microphone that you're having dinner with. And even though it may be in a loud, crowded conversation, it will pick their voice up because their mouth is just over that microphone and basically stream it directly into your ears. So that <laughs> helps a lot in situations. That's very similar to what you're talking about. And then okay. it helps. Yeah. Great options. Um, yeah. Technology. My doctor has one of those. Yeah. Uh, we have professors that work at the University of Chicago here that we have as patients. And they have uh, pass around a little microphone. <laughs> and uh, when people ask questions, so they're able to hear them a lot better because it streams directly to their ears. I think that's fantastic. Any option like that, if you can get a hold of it, is amazing. All right. As far as the university goes, these are all the different options that we have for hearing loss. Our hearing loss team goes to. So there are a ton of these. We have one in Orland Park, uh, one of the south suburbs of the city. Uh, that's a brand new building. Uh, just below that, we have the River East location. That one's in downtown, and that one's right over next to Lurie Children's Hospital in Northwestern Downtown Hospital. We do have our hearing loss team in there now as well. Uh, the one in the dead center, that is our main hospital for the University of Chicago. That's where I am right now. Uh, our team is massive here, so we're more than happy to help you out in any way that we can. And then we have, on the bottom right, we have Flossmore. That is one of our newest locations. That's also a south suburb. Um, we have two audiologists there at all times, so we can take care of you there as well. We also do hearing and balance-related issues. We can help out with both. And then uh, the newest one that we've just gotten into on the top right is at South Shore. It's on the corner of 71st and South Shore. I go there uh, every other Friday. Uh, and currently, I'm the only one that goes there so far, but uh, it has gotten huge popularity-wise, so I have a feeling we're going to be expanding days there pretty soon. So any of those options are available for our team. And if you're interested in coming to see us, like I said, we cover the gambit of anything hearing-related. And if you ever have any trouble with transportation or even some financial things. We have a social work team that does help out tremendously with that. We have patients that live two or three hours away that our social workers are able to help get them into their appointments, which is fantastic. Um, so those are definitely options. I see, Lori, you got a question there. I got a comment again. I thought go you were familiar. I go to uh, South Shore and mm -hmm. I think you did the, did the checkup on me. I may have. Yeah, absolutely. If you're coming there for hearing, that's definitely me. Great to see you. All right. I don't know if it was Jenny or Beverly that had their hand raised first, but go for it. This, this is Beverly. What is the number that I can reach you on South Shore? Let me see. I'm going to get you our South Shore specific number here. Give me just a second. Because I know we have a main number, but sometimes the main number does not connect with the hearing loss portion yet because I think it just we're so new. So the South Shore number here, I'm going to type it in the chat here too for you to have. It is 773-702-8840. So that number there, that is our front desk for our South Shore Senior Center. Thank you. You're very welcome. Jenny. Yes, sir. I have a comment and two questions. Go for my it. First, my first comment is I'm on Medicare Advantage. Mm -hmm. And uh, for a number of years now, they have had 
uh, one of those things where you have to go to their their um, partner. Yeah. But I talked to the audiologist first, and they said they'd had very good experience with them. So I finally gave in and went. And uh, you have a choice of um, they use their prescription, but you have a choice of 199 per ear or 499 per ear, depending on how much assistance you want. But it's been very uh, useful for me and uh, allowed me for the first time to even think of, of uh, getting hearing aids. That is fantastic so, news. It makes me so happy to hear that. Yeah. And since that time, they now give, a, um, this is Advocate, now gives a, a credit card that you can use only for those Medicare Advantage things, hearing, uh, vision, or dental work. And you can use it in any way you want to uh, with those three things only. And it's, that's very helpful. Then you don't have to keep putting in claims. You just pay for something uh, uh, and so on. Uh, I have a question of your specialty, and that is that I've seen a number of cochlear implants with babies and young children over the many, many, many years. And I'm wondering for, for elderly or senior people, uh, golden age, whatever you want to call it, um, what's the percentage of people who need it and, and, and get it? So that's a, that's a great question. That's a huge topic for us right now, too. Um we found that 70% of people that qualify for a cochlear implant do not get a cochlear implant because they're nervous about having surgery. And uh, so a little over 20% of the people that could benefit greatly from them actually have them. So we're trying to make sure that we're doing better about reaching out to people to make sure they have the information they need in order to make that decision. But it is a big life decision, and I completely recognize that. But I do feel also there's been a lot of misinformation passed around the world about what cochlear implants are capable of as well. For example, I had a family about two years ago, two or three years ago, tell me that they didn't want to get a cochlear implant because their doctor told them it would have to be surgically removed and replaced every two years. And that's simply not true. Um, in fact, they last so long that we don't know how long they last yet. I have a patient of mine right now that's had theirs for 33 years and it's still working just fine. Um, we average try to tell people like 25, 27, but the truth is we don't know because they're just not failing. <laughs> um, they're only about 30, 35 years old and like the mainstream use of cochlear implants right now. So uh, as far as how well they can do, I think I'd say 80, 85 percent of the people that we work with do extremely well. There is a wide range of how well you can do with a cochlear implant. I never guarantee anybody that they're going to be talking on the phone or anything like that. Uh, the best I guarantee people is that you can hear where sounds are coming from. But most people do quite well with them and are able to have meaningful conversations. It just depends on your hearing loss how long you've had that hearing loss and just kind of how your brain and nerves in your brain have functioned. But uh, I think they're a very underutilized, amazing resource. Are they when, ever reversed by choice of the person or by, for medical reasons? What do you mean reversed? Taken off. Sometimes. Um, for medical reasons, we, there is a small chance there's a, uh, 0.2% chance that it could fail uh, and we might have to replace it at that point. Um, we've had a patient that had a diagnosis of a certain type of cancer and it had to be removed because the radiation treatments caused the area to swell a little bit, but that's extremely rare as well. Um, but for most people that have them, they do quite well with them. We really don't have to take them out very often. Um, that reminds me also to a point out the ringing and buzzing that I mentioned earlier, I was going to talk about. I promise I didn't forget about it. Uh, these type of options with cochlear implants and hearing aids might not necessarily cure ringing and buzzing, but we have noticed that a lot of people over time, if you use hearing aids and, or cochlear implants, it can reduce the intensity of people's ringing and buzzing. But that's something that also comes with time too. I've had cochlear implant patients that have had bad ringing, and then after about a year, they said it just stopped. But that's not a guarantee for anybody. Sorry, I just wanted to put that plug in there while we were still talking about it. I want to make sure I didn't forget. This has been an awesome conversation. 
I'd like to comment if I could about uh, mine is not ringing or buzzing. That's why I didn't recognize what it might be. It sounds like I have a huge fan behind me and it's Heard a whooshing, a mm -hmm. great whooshing sound. Um, luckily, I mean, thank heavens it's not a ringing or a musical tone. I'd drive me crazy. But um, this one I can just ignore. And, and it's sometimes I notice it and sometimes I don't. Yeah, absolutely. There's the first thing when people will say that they have ringing or buzzing or any sounds like that. One of the first things I always recommend is uh, having some kind of distractor because a lot of people notice it more when it's quiet in the room and there's no other sounds. Your brain kind of hones in on it. So a lot of people, if they sleep with a fan on or a noise machine or something like that, your brain will focus on that rather than the ringing or the buzzing and typically helps people fall asleep. It's just a lot more prevalent a lot of times in very quiet areas. Speaking of very quiet, could I ask a personal question? And that is that I live alone, no sound in the house most of the time when I'm working on my computer or whatever. And so why put the hearing aids in? So that's a great question. And I would still recommend putting the hearing aids in. That's what because, I thought. <laughs> absolutely. And the reason is, even though that you think you're not really getting anything out of it because it's quiet, they are still picking up some environmental sounds. And they're stimulating that nerve and helping stimulate your brain. So if we're not stimulating the nerves in the brain, it can lead to other issues. So I always recommend keeping them in, even in quiet situations, just to keep some stimulation going to your brain. Thank you. Absolutely. It's been fantastic. And then just a quick little summary of everything we're talking about. I'd be more than happy to stay and keep asking, answering questions. But uh, hearing loss, multiple causes. We've talked about the social, mental, and physical when it comes to balance, memory loss, dementia, and social settings. We have tons of treatment options, as we've talked about, and our team is always available. Um, if you want to see anybody at our team, that is the phone number right there on the bottom left-hand corner, and I can type it in as well if you need to. That goes to our main line at the university hospital, and we can connect you if most of the time. South Shore is really new, so it's kind of the exception right now. But if you call this number and tell them which office location that you would like to go to is closest to you, the ones that we went over, they should be able to help get you scheduled for that. Um, our website, uchicagomedicine.org slash hearing. It will take you right to our team's page. And my email address is there at the bottom, personal email address. So if you email that, it go directly to my computer. And that is our wonderful team at the University of Chicago there. And uh, that picture was taken at like 6.30 in the morning. It was very, very early. And we're, we're faking smiles being up. But <laughs> it was a great time. Um, but yeah, any other questions that anybody might have? I love talking about this. Absolutely. What you got, Mary? Um, I had a friend who was looking up some resources for me because we have a hard time talking to each other or she has a hard time being heard by me. Okay, so what um, my condition, uh, my hearing loss stems from os uh, otosclerosis. Yep, otosclerosis. And she saw that there's a surgery called stapendectomy. Mm -hmm. that has a 90% success rate that would help somebody like me with this cause. Absolutely. So find out more about it and who does it. And Yeah. So we have two surgeons uh, specifically on our team that do that procedure. Uh, if you've made an appointment with either of them, I'm sure they'd be able to evaluate you to see whether or not it would benefit you. I'm going to type both of their names in the chat bar so you can see how to spell them. Um, let's see. The first one I'm typing in is Dr. Michael Gluth. He is a specialist when it comes to those type of ear procedures, specifically stapedectomies, otosclerosis. He works any kind of complex ear procedure. And so does my other colleague, Dr. Ted Embry. Um, when you type his name in, it may pop up and say Terrence Embry, which is his real name, but he just goes by Ted. Either one of them are fantastic, amazing at what they do. They're amazing surgeons, and I literally see them every day. They're great at what they do. Can you tell me a little bit more about what this procedure 
does or how yeah. you mm -hmm. affect it afterwards or so the stapedectomy in particular um what that is is there are three tiny little ear bones that we have that lead to our inner ear that kind of boost sounds up um otosclerosis kind of freezes one of those little ear bones to where it can't move as well right. so a stapedectomy is essentially removing one of those ear bones or surgically fixing one of those little ear bones to make sure that the little bone is fluctuating to your inner ear to make you hear better oh yeah it specifically targets that little area great question Okay. Thank you. Thank you. You're very, very welcome. Any other questions about anything? And that number that I gave you for our uh, main office, the one that I'm at right now, that I'm going to type in the chat too. Uh, there we go. That is our main office scheduling line there and if you want to see one of those surgeons that number will work for them as well uh, um, so that same number anybody in the speech de speech therapy department audiology specifically any of the ent surgeons and our social worker you can call that number and they can get you in touch or an appointment for anybody on our team could you put that on again or is it in the chat it's in the chat there but i can share it as well absolutely let me put that up here again uh, there we go i think you can see it oh yeah okay yeah yeah well, that number there with the key thank you thank you you're very very welcome i very much enjoy chatting with y'all this is i'm a chatterbox obviously i love talking to new people and talking through what they're going through so this is one of my favorite things to do honestly um, this year has just been extremely busy and we were in the midst of what we refer to as conference season. So we're uh, going to speak at a bunch of conferences and I have two more in the next month and I will finally be done and then things will slow down for me, but it's been stressful leading up to it. <laughs> but, do you have, uh, do you have some other, su uh, other subjects that you could, in, in this area that you could enlighten us as much as you've done today? Other subjects? Um, Anything hearing loss related, uh, yeah. I also do a lot with um, any hearing loss topic, honestly. They're like my favorite things to talk about. Um, anything when it comes to medical law, also, uh, I also specialize in that, weirdly enough. Um, but anything hearing loss when it comes to, I could do a whole presentation about cochlear implants for you guys. Uh, a whole conversation or presentation about how a hearing aid works specifically, anything like that. Um, I could talk about cochlear implants for hours specifically. <laughs> I do regularly. Um, and I teach at three or four universities for cochlear implants as well. Um, Salish University in Pennsylvania, University of Toronto. Um, I was an assistant professor at the University of Nebraska Medicine for four and a half years for cochlear oh, implants. Sure. So, yeah, I'm uh, very knowledgeable about cochlear implants and just hearing loss in general. So any question that you may have for that. Anything specific, let me know, and I'll definitely find a time, especially after July 13th. <laughs> Conference season will be over July 13th, thankfully. This has been one of the most stressful conference years I think I've ever had. <laughs> Going to Africa in two weeks. Where? Uh, Tunisia. I'm going to oh. Tunisia and speaking at a medical conference there in two weeks. Well, and uh, prepping for that. And then after we get back, I think three or four days after we get back from Africa, we have to fly to Vancouver, Canada for the last one of the year. Mm. So one side of the world to the other within a week. So that's going to be a very jet lag filled experience. Well, it, it, it seems to me that as people live longer mm -hmm. and are relatively healthy, that ear things like ears and eyes are going to need more and more help. 100 percent yeah so i'm really glad we, that we're focusing on it more yes me too i'm and, also and thank you i'm also interested in prevention i would love to have a, a thing on prevention coming from a family of musicians that used to have to sit in front of me when i played trumpet um and you know uh, a lot of because you know, there's a lot of prevention that we didn't get 
as children and young people. And, uh, and I think that people are, you know, they're immortal, so they don't care what's going to happen later. But we've got to prevent our grandchildren from ha having these terrible hearing losses and losing those little tubes you showed us. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. I mean, even speaking from my own personal experience, when I was in the military, hearing protection was not encouraged in any way. And now it's kind of a mandatory thing for service members that right. shoot firearms. So my hearing loss came from the era of, oh, you're shooting a machine gun. That's completely fine. It's not going to do anything. Yes. Um, and it comes back to bite you. You're right. Young people were immortal. I remember when I first got into the military, I felt invincible and that nothing would ever happen to me. And then uh, as the years go by, I wake up in the morning and feel that that's not the case. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, you're right. We do need to be better about prevention. Now that we're getting all this technology that focuses on putting things to our eyes and our ears, I think it's actually, it's a good thing technology wise, but for our bodies, it's kind of hurting them faster. So I think we're going to see a rise in hearing loss and a rise in eye issues as well, because we have screens everywhere and we have things in our ears like crazy. Plus there really isn't a limit too much to what volume levels you can set things to now and i'm just as guilty of it i love loud music and i know it's going to come back to bite me one day but uh we do need to focus more on emphasis of prevention i couldn't agree more okay. well thank it, you very much very absolutely this is absolutely this is always fun every time i get asked to talk at something i'm like I'm going to talk for 10 minutes than anybody that's ever met me was like, yeah, maybe an hour and 10 minutes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, we appreciate it. Anytime. Much, I love doing you. this. Okay. Thank you. You're thank very you welcome. So much. Thank you, Ashley, as well for introducing. Yeah. Us. And uh, yeah, stick around, everybody, if you're interested. Um, Laura Cracky will be leading uh, our uh, informal to chat conversation <laughs> thanks again so very much everyone for being here and thank you dr sevier for the wonderful presentation uh and have a fabulous rest of of your day today everyone thanks a lot too have a great day safe travels bye everyone thank you nice